think uh, it's amazing to hear Scripture in a few different languages and be aware that of all the churches around the world who are partaking in communion today, the three languages that we heard represent just a small fraction of all of the languages speaking the gospel today. I think it's a good time to remind ourselves, too, that Although we may forget this often, Jesus did not speak English. Jesus did not ever hear English. And um, so I think it's, it's a good reminder for us uh, to be aware that sometimes the language that God does speak transcends our differences far better than our own languages do. God speaks the language of love, which looks not just at what we say, but what's on our heart. I look out tonight and see uh, people sitting here uh, who have been on mission trips to Swaziland, to Haiti, uh, to Guatemala with this church. And I think while they speak different languages in all of those places, the one thing that we could tell you about all of those places is that sometimes the most powerful conversation you can have with someone is the one where you have no idea what they're saying. Because there's some kind of connection to the human spirit, the love of God that connects us all, um, no matter what words come out of our mouth. And so here on World Communion Sunday, I think that's just another reminder uh, that God is always, always, always bigger than we are. We say a word of prayer with me. Holy One, tonight on this special Sunday, as all the world comes together to proclaim your love and your goodness, Remind us that we are mere vessels, that we seek to be filled with your love and your hope and your goodness. May the words of my mouth, meditations of all of our hearts, be acceptable in your sight. Amen. As Andrew shared with us, as you hopefully picked up by now, today is World Communion Sunday. How many of you were aware of that before you walked in the door today? and before you got the newsletter from us saying that it was today. Um, World Communion Sunday, I think in some ways it's, it's actually very easy for us in Disciples of Christ churches where we have communion every week, it's easy for us to forget about World Communion Sunday. Because in a lot of ways for us, every single Sunday is World Communion Sunday. We have communion every week. But if you walked into a church where you didn't have communion every week and you just had it once a quarter or once a month or once a year, um, and you saw the altar set up, you would begin to wonder what is different about today. And so that's the curiosity that each one of us is invited to bring. What is different about today? It's a symbolic day when Christians from all over the world of, of different backgrounds, different beliefs, different denominations, and even different continents come together and share a bread and cup wherever and whoever their church may be, what language they speak, what place they live in, wherever they are, today we are united. But for us, of course, uh, this table is a sign of unity, a symbol of hope, week after week. But we should be mindful in a disciple's church that while we seek to have an open table for all people every single week, that that connects us with a lot of other people, but it only connects us with other disciples' churches and other denominations who share those kinds of practices. Um, so today, we are connected to something even larger than just this one movement. It's a special day because we are connected to Christians on different continents with bread and cup through grain and grape, no matter how we understand what those things mean. I know many of you well enough to know the backgrounds that you come from and know that we all bring different ideas and thoughts about what this means. Some of us come from backgrounds where the bread and the cup are thought of as the actual body and blood of Jesus. Some of us come from traditions where you might have taking communion as milk and Oreos at a campfire. Anywhere in between, we probably have those ideas represented in this room. 
how powerful it is to know that even in these extraordinarily complicated and divisive times, that there is still a sign of unity for all of us. Christians can still come together over something that matters. Unity is a beautiful gift. I think it's a godly gift. But it's one that we know all too often is fleeting. And Luke's gospel, which you heard three times now, so I'm going to hold you accountable to that. Luke's gospel reminds us that unity is often fleeting. There on the night when Jesus was betrayed, he gathered with his disciples. Words you've likely heard before. We say them week after week in this space. He gathered with his disciples. Familiar words. But how often do you think about what happens next in the story? Okay, they get together and Jesus shares the bread and the cup and he says that thing about remembering me. They take the bread, they take the cup. What happens next? Maybe the disciples sing Kumbaya and all start talking about how they can go out and serve people who are poor. That's what we might hope would happen. But Luke tells us a different story. Luke says they take the bread and the cup that Jesus gives them, and before they can even get up from the table, what do they do? They start fighting. They start arguing. They don't even make it to the next course of the meal. They're sitting there at the table, and before they can get up, they argue. Right after they pinch off that little piece of bread, drink from the cup, they begin to argue. Something that's either incredibly shocking or incredibly predictable. Now, I know what you all are thinking right now. It's impossible to imagine a group of disciples who take communion together to begin to argue with one another. But use your imagination as far as that thought might be. They take the bread and the cup and begin to argue. It's not enough to be in the presence of Christ as equals. They have to ask him, Jesus Who's the greatest among us? I mean, can you, can you imagine, usually here at the bridge, the deacons go to the banner at the outside of the room, and on the best of nights, it can be a powerful experience. Can you imagine going to take the bread and the cup? And I love that all the deacons say different things uh, when that's served here. And you take the bread and the cup, and you just kind of whisper to the deacon, but I'm better than that person, right? You gave me a bigger portion, right? That's what the disciples do, but not just to a deacon at the outside of the room. They do it with Jesus. Jesus, thanks for the bread and the cup, but who's the greatest? Tell me what I really came here to find out. They want to hear for themselves why they are better than everyone else. The irony of this, of course, is not lost on anyone who's been around faith communities. Even the very fact that we have to have a World Communion Sunday, as powerful of an idea as it is. The fact that we have to all agree to take communion on the same day and mark it on our calendar a year in advance. Because some of us take the Lord's Supper once a month, and some of us take Eucharist every week, and some of us take communion every time we get together. On and on and on, whatever the difference is, whatever we call it, whatever we understand it to be. And sometimes these arguments even turn violent over transubstantiation. What do the symbols mean? How many centuries did Christians fight about that? Who is worthy of taking in communion? Who's worthy of coming before Christ to take communion? And who deserves to be shut out from the meal because they're not worthy? Somehow the very ritual that is supposed to bring us together, that is supposed to unite us, the very ritual that's supposed to do that thing has, for centuries, caused Christians to fight. Who on the outside of this thing called Christianity is going to look inside 
and decide that they should walk in the doors because we're all ready to tell us how much better we are than they are. Who is the greatest? But that question puts us in really good company with Peter and James and John and all the other disciples who were there at the first meal. Now, if you are like me, when you read this story and you, you read this and you appreciate just how beautiful that moment must have been for the first communion, and then you get to the, the part where they start arguing, you probably think, I would never do that. And when we say that, we miss the point of the story. Because if the disciples themselves, the ones who are with Jesus, we can sit around arguing 2,000 years later over what the right translation is and what this means and what that means, but they actually got to hear them week after week after week. If they are capable of that, then we are capable of it too. Far too often, even in this space sometimes, when the lights come up after we take communion, it's far too easy to start blaming someone else, figuring out how we are greater and how they are lesser. And I'm not sure, frankly, if we'll ever break that cycle. If one day in Christian history books they'll just write about 2016 or 17 or 18 as the year that all the Christians stopped fighting with each other. Maybe. I'm not sure. But I think that we're called to try. I think we're called to do our part, to set aside the question of who is greater. And the only way to begin to break that cycle is by listening to what happens next in the story. That They all start arguing. And did you listen to what Jesus says? Jesus doesn't jump into the argument with the rest of them and tell them why they're wrong. As they're all sitting around arguing, Jesus just kind of speaks to them. In my imagination, it's just kind of a whisper that commands attention. The greatest among you must become like the youngest. The leader, like the one who serves. For who is greater, Jesus asks, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. Surely we all know what Jesus is talking about here. You're at fill-in-the-blank, your favorite restaurant. And the waiter walks by and is in too much of a hurry to stop to refill your glass. And you all, being good Christians, are very nice about it. Or maybe we begin to feel smug about it. Say, you work for my tips, right? You work for me. Greater, less than. Jesus acknowledges that the way we all think, of course, the one who's sitting down at the table is the greater. But Jesus says, that's not me. I didn't come here to be served. I didn't, be, I didn't come here for you all to do something for me. I came to serve. And if you want to follow me, you've got to do that. You've got to stop asking who is the greatest and jump in there and help someone else. That's the only way to break the cycle. No matter how many miracles the disciples did, no matter how many people they told about Jesus, the only way they could have broken that cycle is by setting aside the fact that I have to be better and superior and greater and instead to serve. That's what Jesus calls us to do. At uh, my college alma mater, TCU. Go Frogs. We have this great tradition that I think Ashley will discover when finals come around in a couple months. Uh, they serve pancakes during exam week. And uh, as a college student, you know, you'll eat pretty much anything that they put in front of you. Um, but, man, pancakes, like, you know, how many people come to our church when we have pancake Sunday? And imagine that if you're a college student, right? 
So we're there in the middle of finals, and everybody's hungry. Everybody's stuck in the library, especially me, because I studied so much. Um, and you hear there's pancakes, and you go to the cafeteria. And I get there just kind of like a zombie towards the maple syrup. And without even looking up to see, you know, who is serving the pancakes. I've been through this line a thousand times for lunch every day up to that point. And just accepting whatever's put on my plate as I go. And after I walk through the line, I look up and see that the chancellor of the university is the one who was serving the pancakes, sitting back there behind the counter with an apron on. That, to me, I think is what Jesus is talking about. This uh, guy that's the chancellor of the university and knows every big donor by name takes the time to just get behind the counter and serve some students. Whatever that looks like for us, no matter how high or low you consider yourself, how do we begin to flip that around? Say, I'm not here to be waited on. I'm here to serve. What does that look like for us? And as we begin to answer that, I've got to think that the kingdom of God must be a strange place. Chancellors wearing aprons saviors refilling cups of juice. The kingdom of God must be a strange place. But I think I'd really like to see it. Will you pray with me? Lord, let this Sunday be different from the rest. The one where we set ourselves aside and live as you want us to live. God, we know that we're not perfect, far from it. But we know, too, that that's not what you ask us to be. You ask us to be ourselves, to be the ones that you made us to be, to be our best selves, not to be served but to serve. God, help us to follow in your ways, to bring the kingdom of God a little closer on earth as it is in heaven. May we be united together as one people who speak only the language of love unconditionally without limits to that compassion. For God, we know that is how you love this world who today is united. But help us now think about tomorrow. Amen.